Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to how to build rapid rapport with even the most difficult clients. Go beyond matching, mirroring and leading for quick rapport building. So I glanced down and the word hate was boldly tattooed across the knuckles of both of one of my client's hands. And my new client was staring or glaring at me with a suspicious look in his eyes. And it was not the most confidence inspiring start to our session. And when I was getting started as a hypnotherapist, the field was awash with um, new age mumbo jumbo. Most inductions centered around whale song, flowery gardens, inner wisdom and the like. And for many people, that's very effective and works really well. So of course, one of my early clients will turn, turn out to be a, a former member of an elite commando unit. And as soon as I walked into his home, I could see he just exuded testosterone. So I had a feeling that this very overtly macho guy would be pretty suspicious of any man he deemed less masculine than himself. So if I'd started talking about whale song and wind chimes, he, he might not have uh, sort of related to that. He called me for help with pain management as he'd been severely uh, injured after a rugby accident and wanted to take an open university degree, so he needed motivation. But if I was to have any hope of facilitating a successful hypnotic trance, I knew I'd need to ditch the wise flowery whales get on his side and work from his perspective as quickly as possible. Building rapport is much more than mirroring, matching and leading. Quickly building rapport with your client makes a huge difference in how effective your therapy with them is going to be. If you've done any training in therapy or sales, you've probably heard about uh, mirroring, matching and leading and for good reason. These elements are the basic and highly effective building blocks of good rapport. So the general idea is that when you want to build rapport with someone, you either mirror their body posture, for instance, subtly cross your arms a moment after they've crossed theirs, or you, know, you mirror their speaking tone and pace and the kind of language they use, sprinkling their unique words and phrases into your own communication, or you match their posture um, as this is even more subtle and less likely to be noticed by the other person. As an example of that, if they cross their arms, you might cross your legs. Okay. So rapport builds as your client unconsciously notices these similarities and starts to feel on some level that you are like them, that the two of you are in tune on the same page. So bit by bit, you can then start to lead them towards a particular line of thought or a more relaxed behavior. If sufficient rapport has developed, the client with, will, without realizing it, mirror and match you, incorporating your ideas, leaning back in their chair a moment after you've leaned back in yours, echoing your enthusiasm for a new skill you're teaching or whatever. But this all takes time and time that you might not have, especially if your client is reluctant to engage in therapy at all or having trouble focusing on the session due to pain or racing stress-filled thoughts. So the faster you can make them feel not just listened to, but understood by you, the sooner they'll begin to connect with and incorporate your therapeutic interventions. So how do you do that? How can you instantly connect with the client in front of you, build rapport and make them feel you uh, get where they're coming from? Matching into trance, the power of utilization. Whenever you want to connect with somebody, you can use the principle of utilization to instantly build rapport. So the simplest approach is to talk about the interests and experiences of the person you're talking with, even if you don't particularly share them. So how did I build rapport with the macho former commando? Well, I knew that having served a long time in the, in the military, this guy knew how to go into trance although I doubted he would have recognized the narrow focus of attention essential to military training as hypnosis. I quickly set out to utilize his understandings and experience. So how can we build an induction that linked to his experience and who he was? So in a very down-to-earth, straightforward way, I explained the nature of hypnotic trance 
the narrowed focus of attention, the fast passing of time, and so forth. And he connected to that immediately. And he said, I know what you mean. Um, when I was in the military, when we used to march 20 miles with packs on our backs, I wouldn't even notice the discomfort or the time passing. I was totally in the zone, totally zoned out and focused. Now, all I'd done was re-evoke a military exercise for him. And in no time at all, he was there in his mind. Then it was easy to lead him step by step from that very alert, focused state of mind, which he'd experienced during the marching, uh, and he was already deeply familiar with, to a deeply relaxed state in which his mind could achieve the receptivity needed to integrate new ideas and perspectives and abilities for pain control. At the end of the session, he said that he felt I was the only professional who'd ever really understood him. Okay. And that's because I just used his experience. More effective communication through utilization. Utilizing the interests of the person you're talking with is an easy and very powerful way of getting them interested in the conversation that you're having with them. So once uh, they're fascinated, you may gradually be able to introduce topics that you find more interesting. Great communicators, which by the way includes people who are great at flirting, do this quite instinctively. Even stand-up comedians employ utilization all the time. What really seems to make people laugh are either things they recognize as true and something they've experienced but perhaps never really put into words before, or everyday things exaggerated to an absurd degree, but it still has to connect with them and their previous experience. In both cases, the comedian utilizes what the audience already understands. So although the examples I give here, of course, come from the field of therapy and hypnosis, the utilization principle is vital for all teaching and all communication. If we want to connect with somebody, we need to connect to their experience. But sometimes too much professional training can knock it out of people. So stop the psycho jargon. Occasionally, just from listening to someone I'm meeting for the first time, I can tell not only that they're, they've had therapy, but the particular ideology in which their therapist was trained. Some people talk as if they've swallowed a self-help book or a um, psychology textbook. You know, every other word is uh, psych jargon, clearly picked up from the particular therapeutic school followed by the therapist um, that they had therapy with. The utilization principle does away with all this. You know, the late great Milton Erickson, perhaps the greatest clinical hypnotherapist of all time, emphasized the vital need to enter the client's world and not inflict psychobabble on them. And in order to influence and heal them, you need to learn and utilize their language, their perspectives, and their understanding, rather than drag them into your way of thinking or saying. Building rapport from the inside out. I think the worst kind of hypnotherapist just uses ready-made scripts. Okay? So there's no regard for the uniqueness of the client in front of them. Understanding and practicing utilization, on the other hand, is respectful to the client. And all scripts and limiting ideological pigeonholes can be discarded because there's simply no need to overwhelm the client with jargon or force our own interests on them, whale song, and wise gardens wouldn't have connected to that commando. So rather than trying to change people from the outside, the good therapist uses whatever the client in front of them already has on the inside. The utilization principle appeals to an individual's unique personality traits and interests to bring about change. So this is a natural progression for the person and at the same time facilitates deeper rapport with them. For example, a smoker who's prone to angry outbursts could be led to direct their anger towards the cigarettes. Okay, so we can use that anger against what's really undermining them. This neither denies nor dismisses the reality of the anger, but utilizes it in a constructive way until the person can learn to manage their anger appropriately. In such a case, it could also be argued that anger directed towards something so potentially lethal is perfectly appropriate. To a computer programmer with a phobia, I might talk about the need for some new software to replace the old software or to reprogram or stuff. To someone who loved the novel Wuthering Heights, I might refer to the exhilaration and relaxation that comes from a walk on the wild and beautiful moors. To someone who was into hang gliding, 
I might speak about rising above and beyond anxiety uh, until it was barely visible. So how can you be limited in your approach when there's such a variety of human beings? Utilizing the gaping problem. Milton Erickson even demonstrated that we can use the client's problem as a way of helping someone progress in life. Uh, Erickson once treated a suicidal girl who was hopelessly convinced uh, she was unattractive and would never find a partner because she had a gap between her two front teeth. And in today's uh, climate, she probably would have had dental work done, but this was back in the 1950s. And instead of trying to argue, she, she really was attractive and telling her to ignore the worries or working to find out the root cause of her problems, Erickson utilized the very thing she worried about to change her thinking. At Erickson's suggestion, the girl squirted water through the ugly gap in her teeth at a young man she often encountered at the water fountain during her office break. And um, I don't know how he got her to do this. And perceiving this behavior as flirtatious, the young man asked her out on a date. So this woman who had thought herself unattractive, partly because of a gap in her front teeth, now found that this so-called flaw had become the catalyst for contact with the opposite sex. And she began a relationship. By utilizing what had been seen by her as a huge problem, Erickson reframed her perception of herself and the possibilities open to her. This is almost zen-like uh, in its use of utilization. No rapport breaking, no argument, no therapy speak, no assumptions about problems running deeper, just direct utilization. The end result? A much happier young woman who had learnt to love the part of herself she once hated. So I hope you found that useful, and if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching.